Please click on the thumbs up button and the subscribe button if you enjoyed my vlog. Bye for now. Hello everybody, wherever you are in the world. Um, today's Zoom is about the Kalkmarsh Nature Reserve. And although I go there a lot, it uh, every out seems to be different. In fact, you could say that for any walking that you go, walk that you go on to on a regular basis. And of course, the first thing I saw was the swan with its neck, neck down and on its wings. It was a, a cold day, actually. And um, on, on this occasion, there were volunteers on site. Now, volunteers uh, never get a mention normally. Uh, but I would like to mention uh, my very old friend who uh, we worked together in from 1977 to 1981 to get this particular site up and running. And my old friend called Keith uh, Bannister. And Keith now in his mid 70s, like myself, uh, has seen a lot of changes on site. And um, uh, anyone that's interested in uh, knowing the, uh, what transpired uh, when we began making the reserve can f find it all out in the book I wrote um, called The Diaries of a Naturalist by John J. Jackson. And you can find the book by going to my bestseller dot co dot uk and i think it's about 10 pound i say i think because it's uh, two or three years since i wrote it now anyway you don't have to know all that uh, you can just go down on site and enjoy the walk and uh, this particular walk of course you can see all the leaves are turning and you'll see more of that later it's just a matter of uh, talking now and finding something to say because uh, the slides I've taken, uh, I've, I'm not really sure how long they are. And I've taken slides because the, um, I need more uh, memory cards for the uh, uh, camcorder. This particular area of the site, the Kelton Mice site, uh, is fairly new. It's something we all, we all wanted but never thought we could get. And one of the problems of creating water areas on site is what do you do with the spoil when you dig it out? It has to go somewhere, and if it goes by vehicle, it costs a lot of money. So you tend to leave the spoil on site, and in this case it's been banked up, and it's been uh, uh, put on various places where you can no longer see it. Now the growth school, uh, what we've got there, Phragmites, I believe, in the background. And you can see the houses above and the field that's already been ploughed for the next crop uh, was never ploughed before because it was too steep. And it's only a recent thing that in the last few years that that's uh, particular field has been cropped, uh, yep, dug and cropped, and it's called Sunnybank, and right at the back of Sunnybank there, on the very top, is a public footpath, and if you go up that footpath, which is very steep, uh, and stand at the top on a clear day, you can see over to Moorland, and you can see wind farms in operation too. And it's uh, it's quite a nice site actually. And I often used to go up there to uh, look down onto the reserve itself because uh, we only had at that time the, the one lake um, near the car park, and there's water all the way down site now. And I used to look over the lake and see if I could see anything, and. Uh, 
I also used to look over from Sunnybank to see if I could see anything in the reeds with a telescope I used to take up there at that time. And uh, the trees you can see at the background, I think we planted all those, most of them anyway. And uh, there is, where the tree line is, there is a path uh, for a, a machinery to go down if necessary. Talking of paths, this is the path where the um, trains used to go on the train line and uh, you can see all the leaves are brown there and I also should mention that with uh, Keith Bannister who was moving some of these leaves was another gentleman and I do apologise to him I forgot to ask him his name but I'll do it again at a later date I'll do another vlog and give him a mention so for people who are watching this from all over the world, it's uh, November, uh, I think about the 3rd of November or something like that. Certainly the first week in November. And uh, coal by, I think, at, um, I think we're talking about 48 Fahrenheit, if you know what Fahrenheit is. If you don't know what Fahrenheit is, uh, double it and add 30 and that gives you roughly the other figure centigrade and so we this is looking back actually because I was walking down on site where I thought what a lovely tunnel tunnel view it looks with the uh, uh, tree trees bowing over the top of the footpath and uh, of course the leaves are dark now uh, almost off the trees uh, there's still a few there you can see and it is at this time of year when uh, stuff's coming into the country that you'll be able to see it better because the leaves are falling i've said that before on uh, the earlier vlogs uh, but i think it's worth a mention for people who are not quite understanding how nature works and probably watching something like this for the first time and if you are you're very welcome to see more of these, but I don't just I, I don't just I, ju I don't just do uh, nature vlogs as you will see with the videos that's in uh, in there for you to look at. One of them actually is uh, um, about artwork, how to draw and stuff like that, and I do sometimes draw when I'm out on site. Now this is. Uh, a J, beautiful coloured blue as you can see and uh, the J is actually uh, collecting food to take to a, I think they call them caches, caches uh, but I prefer to call them larders and J's are not the only ones that have larders, magpies have larders and uh, like squirrels do and uh, one or two more birds um, I can think of uh, um, willow tit I believe they have them as well and so when times are bad they go and uh, open the ladders up now um, I have followed one ladder over the years I've, because I've been coming down on this site now over 50 years and I've, so I've done lots of surveys on this site and I was able to follow a magpie, uh, which I put this information in the book, by the way, um, for five years using the same spot every time, the same larder um, uh, in a field it was, uh, which is adjacent to the Carlton Marsh Nature Reserve. And so the jay, uh, in, on this occasion, will probably pick something up off the ground take it to its destination now jays are notorious for moving about all the time so i was very lucky to get this shot but i employed a little trick again i've mentioned this trick and if there's a bend in the footpath uh, and it's bending right go to the right hand side and don't cross over onto the left until the very last second and this means that the bird will probably not be able to see you, although you'll not be able to see it at that point. 
but you may have seen it first before you, you uh, adopted the technique I'll just mention to you. So a beautiful bird, the jay, and uh, don't see many of them. Having said that, I was in the park, uh, the local park, uh, and it, there was a jay there. I did wonder if it was the same bird. And uh, so it's possible because the distance between the park, my local park that is, and uh, the carp mice as the crow, crow flies is probably a few minutes. Now this shot here as uh, with the J on it, I do apologise for this one. It's uh, 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 out of focus and uh, I did think that the J was central to the uh, photograph, but it's not. But what you can see is the the vegetation that it's looking at or taking food from is still lush green. You can see in the distance that the leaves are all um, dead and brittle. Now, while I while I saw Keith and his, uh, the other person on uh, on the site, I did mention to them that. I'd like to make a vlog on site, if they wouldn't mind, of uh, trees. I did, when I was, um, we all know, or probably most of us will know that uh, leaves uh, photosynthesize from the sun and send energy to the tree itself, and sugars and saps and things like that. And I, I was walking in a woodland when I was a young man and I saw uh, a sapling of, of a tree right in the middle of a wood where there was no light at all. And I thought, now how can this tree grow uh, and put leaves on if there's no photosynthesizing going on from the sun? There's no sun at all getting to this tree. Well, I've since learned that uh, trees and saplings help one another out. And uh, I'm going to make a, a vlog on that if, if I can get all the information together. together. I'm also, I know most of what I want to discuss, but I will have to refer to uh, the latest information on that to make sure I'm conveying it properly to you. And there's three photographs on this one and right at the side of a footpath uh, going down site uh, is lot, there's lots and lots of apples. Now there could be several reasons for that and they look like eating apples don't they? And this, um, this footpath once was a railway line. And you would be hard pressed to find any old sleepers now, but there is one or two still on site. And it's possible that the driver of the train threw out an apple and the seed uh, grew in the ground and uh, the apples. There is a, another possibility, and that is that the uh, birds have been eating uh, apples, apple seeds, and they have, uh, it's passed through their body and stratified in the soil. That's another theory. I'll never really know, but uh, there's all sorts of uh, different views and different ideas, and you can go out and find these things, and you can sort them out as you're going on your walks, and it adds a little bit more interest to the walk itself. And um, I think this slide is probably a bit too long to keep speaking about it. But you can, you can see that some of the apples have ripened. Some have not before they fall into the ground. And that's partly due to weather conditions. And I believe... We had a frost on that week, 
so it's possible that the frost help aid the fruit off the trees. Now if there's any people out there that um, farmers etc that know about apples please let me know uh, in your comments below and I will uh, I will have a look at that and I'll pass the information on um, as and when I get it uh, on blogs such as this and you can see there look that there's uh, lots more apples than you would uh, expect and the other thing is that um, I'm really surprised that some of these apples have not been taken by people uh, once they're on the ground of course nobody wants to know and that's fair point actually and the other fair point is that it is a nature reserve and most people respect when they come in onto the site that it is for uh, reserve for, for nature and so because they've left the apples there it means that there's a lot of uh, people out there who are really trusting and I thank them all for that once again you can see that there's a little bit of uh, uh, grass there in green and on the right hand side it's already turned and on the left hand side where the footpath is already we really need to wear boots because the soil is churning up and it's hard packed there normally uh, where people's shoes and boots have been over the years um, now there is a talk of opening a railway station again at Cudworth uh, and I don't know where it's going to be I personally don't think it will be affected by the reserve uh, or the reserve would be affected by the train line and the train station. I have to come down and have a look at that. Uh, and if you uh, are one of those people who likes to uh, record history, uh, get to know what's happening before it happens and take a photograph, just like I do, and then take another photograph when the change has occurred and um, it gives you a good idea of what's going on it's a little bit like in a way it's, it, I'm not trying to be patronising but it's a little bit like uh, when you have your child a baby or children or have a puppy or anything like that and you keep taking photographs and you look back over the change of what's happened to those uh, children and puppies and so on and so forth. And that's how I record uh, nature. I go in there, as soon as I get to know something might be changing, and I take the photographs. And uh, take the photographs afterwards as well. And the latest one I've just done is called um, Vintage Barnsley. And it's uh, photographs taken while the old buildings were up and in some cases where the old buildings were being taken down. And um, I, my next thing of course is to take a, a film of photographs of the new buildings that's gone up and if I'm, if I'm, uh, if I can, I'll uh, show on one video the old buildings and the new and transpose it across so that you can see how it was before and how it is now and that's really all I've done, I've done that all, all my life and uh, it's, it's proven to be really interesting to me and to other people who, who like natural history now I did call these vlogs uh, vlogs of a naturalist uh, at one time and I couldn't get anybody to have a look at the the, uh, the the vlogs and a friend of mine said no because it sounds too much like um, something else another word so that's why I've gone back to using the vlogs uh, uh, old John's vlogs and uh, it's self-descriptive I'm an old man now, 
I wasn't when I first was on this site. I was only in my 20s. And uh, we, I used to come down with other friends. There was about 14 of us originally. Unfortunately, some have passed away. Others have moved out of the district. And uh, Cliff Gorman still comes down on site. He's one of the original people. Keith Brock, he's the... Sorry, Keith Bannister. Keith Brock is a friend I used to work with. Keith Bannister is also one of the original people. And the two, those two people I've just mentioned have been volunteering their services uh, ever since I left them in 1981 and still are volunteering. So they, you know, they should get full praise for uh, their efforts. Um, quite frankly, I'm too old to carry on and do that now. Uh, so, but they're still there, they're still doing it. And so... Uh, my, I take my hat off to these people. To those people that are, are not in Yorkshire, taking your hat off is really a compliment. I'm making a compliment. Now the other thing, of course, I have mentioned before is the dialect I use, which is uh, South Yorkshire dialect. It sounds to some people gruff and grum. And I also uh, wouldn't normally use my H's, uh, but I am doing today, and I am trying to speak a little bit more clearly than I would normally do. I, um, I would, I would probably say things like, "Oh, ain't you? Ain't you done that then?" And lots of people in the world would not understand what that means, and uh, I appreciate that. And it, what it does mean is, "Oh, haven't you done that?" And so it's a different way of speaking to say the same things. But I were I once was working um, in a college with uh, foreign students, and they really wanted to hear how people in Yorkshire had their sayings, and they used to emulate. And it sounded very very funny from people in German. German people, Spanish people, Italian people, Russian people and French people trying to emulate the Yorkshire accent. But it was great fun. They enjoyed it. And I, they had a good laugh at me trying to uh, speak their languages. Uh, I, did, I did quite well actually at one time. Can't do it now. I've been left work um, quite some time. <laughs> Quite a few years now. So anyway, the third shot here shows... Uh, I, I don't know why I took three shots of this one. Well, I don't know why I took three shots on this one, but I don't know why I put three shots on. Because uh, I'm, I'm really running out of things to say. But it does emphasise how much fruit there is uh, uh, out there at the moment. And the other thing is, I have mentioned in earlier vlogs, is that we've not been getting birds coming to the garden for the seeds and other things. And this is one of the reasons why. There's still plenty of food out there. And the, the seasons seem to be merging instead of having four. We seem to be having more like two, or I should say autumn is extending and winter is getting shorter. Now in some ways that's not good uh, because I will mention that as I speak about trees. And uh, and of course from a bird watching point of view um, because ornithology is part and parcel of what I've studied for years uh, it also throws up um, uh, birds that people have not seen in this country before or in some cases not seen for many many years uh, because of the climate's changing and I really should say at this point that um, I think we all owe it to ourselves to try and do something to help the uh, environment now one of the things I've done over the years is I've planted lots of trees and I am um, now looking towards trying to convince people that if, as an example, 
they want to plant Bodleia. Bodleia should be planted uh, every 10, 20 yards maybe, metres uh, apart or 30 metres apart so that the uh, moths and the butterflies can continue moving from one to the other. Uh, of course when the sun goes out, sorry, when the sun goes down or the clouds come out, uh, they, they can't get warm so they have to go away the sun. Now I've mentioned uh, this this uh, particular uh, snake, I think it's a grass snake isn't it, probably was uh, disturbed by something which I want to speak about later. This is the first time over all those years that I've been going on site, over 50 years, that I've ever seen a snake on the, on the Cart Mice Nature Reserve. Now my friends have seen them, and for years I couldn't understand why they were seeing uh, snakes, and I wasn't. And the thing about what I feel discovered was that I walk with a bit of a waddling gait and it's partly to do with an injury I had in my knee as a young man uh, the first time was through judo and the second time was through a work experience same knee and so it's left me with a bit of a waddling gait and the waddling gait what happens there is that my clothes rustle whereas friends who well, have not got a waddling gait, their claws don't rustle and it doesn't disturb the snakes. They can get to the snake, wherever it is, before the snake hears their clawing or takes the smell, whatever it does, uh, and um, feels the vibrations. Um, and they can see the snakes and that's why I can't. They can hear or feel my vibrations as I walk almost from side to side. And this also is, is a problem for me when I'm for, uh, taking um, my movies on the camcorder. It, while I'm, if I walk a distance, um, it appear, the film is from side to side. And uh, so I try not to do long drawn out films where the uh, person's eyes are drawn to this motion uh, of, of movement uh, because, uh, quite frankly, you get fed up of it. But you can see the, I, th I think you can just see the head of the snake there. And what happened, the reason why I didn't get as, as many views of this snake as I would have liked, I was standing quiet taking four, two or three photographs and someone came past and they were speaking and I thought now if I don't speak to these people but I point to what I'm looking at they will come and have a look and keep quiet and that's what happened so the snake was only going away slowly rather than trying to escape quickly and I suspect it was slowly because it was a cold day and uh, you can see that it was moving into vegetation once again leaves are there plenty of leaves for it to get into and also still green grass which I mentioned earlier and uh, it was a treat for me to see actually um, I think this Possibly, it's the first snake I've ever seen on all my thousands of uh, walks I've been on over the years. Probably hundreds of hundreds and hundreds of hours spent walking or sitting. Um, you know, I used to sit in woodland, waiting for things to come to me, rather than me going to it. Um, in the past things like hedgehogs have come and gone past my feet in the winter and uh, stoats and weasels and things like that have passed me but never ever a snake 
And so it was a real treat for me to see this. And I'm ever so pleased. Um, now when I went back to off-site uh, to tell Keith Bannister who would have told uh, Cliff Gorman and they would have recorded it in their uh, log, log book uh, Keith had actually gone home and I, who can blame him it, it, the work he was doing was very very hard and they were using long long rakes to move lots and lots of leaves so this is the final shot of the snake going away and at this point actually I was um, trying to get the shot uh, while the other people were taking theirs off their mobile phones. Um, mine was a camera with a zoom on. So as I said to you earlier I was very very pleased to get this, these shots and uh, I wonder actually if I'll ever see one ever again. But that's uh, that's the beauty about going out for a walk. You can go on the same walk every day for most of your walking day life and you will see something different every day if you know what to look for. And if you don't know what to look for, uh, over the years uh, you will build knowledge up and that knowledge will learn you different things until you do know what to look for. Now I did mention earlier that um, there was a field being ploughed over called the Sunny Bank and that was uh, the first time that I had ever seen what it had been ploughed over uh, probably for the first time as well. Um, so every time you see something like that it, the landscape changes and what uh, what happens then is that once the landscape changes for instance we put thousands of trees in here we change the landscape for the Count National Reserve once the landscape changes it changes everything around it um, and on this particular day after Sunny Bank had been uh, ploughed I it was snowing and I was looking through my binoculars at this field and I, at that time I used to look at everything uh, you know every every blade of grass and um, just if I could find new things so we could put them in the log and um, I saw my very first uh, ring ozels down here and I think it was the first rec record for ring ozels. I'm not sure, not sure if they've been ever been seen since. So please, if you you know, have a look for ring ozels or anything like that when you go out walking. Um, and it, once again, this is a, uh, probably a shot that I probably shouldn't have taken, but I was so excited to see the. Uh, snake that I took off as many shots as I could get before it went out of sight. So I'm mentioning walking and uh, it, sometimes if you go with a friend you'll see more, sometimes you'll listen to what your friend's got to say and see less but it doesn't matter as long as you're enjoying the walk and usually if you go on a site like the Carlton Marsh Nature Reserve where you go down it and then you have to turn back and go back up it. On the way back, and I'll say this many times, and I'll say it again and again, what you see going down it, you might see something completely different that you've missed going back up it. And uh, on, um, on the occasion that I came to sight on, on the Carlton Marsh site on this particular day, there was uh, the car park was full and I wondered why I had, I had nowhere to park the car luckily for me uh, somebody was just pulling out when I was trying to find a parking spot and I was ever grateful 
and thank these people for letting me know that they were going. And um, the reason why the car park was full, I will show you uh, as we progress through the slides. And uh, the car park at one time was far too big, and now because the reserve is getting more popular, may have to be extended at some point. Now, while I'm just talking in general terms, oh, I didn't know take my time there, but what a close shot that is. You can see every scale, and they all appear to be the same size. Wow, look at that. And some are a little bit discoloured, and the pattern there you can see is uh, all too familiar really and it's all set out so that it's in equal parts and you know when I looked at this I thought what a beautiful object this snake is and uh, I didn't realize until I saw it actually saw it and this is the difference between seeing it on TV and actually witnessing something like that. I didn't realise how beautiful these these creatures are in their own environment. But just uh, slightly getting back to the car park again while we're talking about that. Uh, it's got CCTV now. Now we used to have that. There's lots of signs up telling people that uh, to please um, see to the dog fowling uh, and uh, there is a picnic area as well don't forget that if you ever wanted to come down here for a long time um, but please take your litter home it's easier to take home than it is to bring I always say that because that's a fact isn't it if you for instance bring a can full of pop it's heavier than when you You've drunk the pop, so why not take it on when it's lighter? <clears throat> and I always say this, and I do. I shouldn't, shouldn't. Uh, I should think it through. When I'm speaking one of these vlogs through, I really should t carry a drink at the side of me, and I forgot to bring one yet again. This must be the third one I've made of slides to talk through all the time. Um, I forgot to bring a drink and I'm drying up. But I will try and improve the quality of sound by a method I'm, I'm trying to perfect uh, by using a sound equaliser afterwards. Uh, if I can't, it's, uh, uh, it's, well, you'll just have to bear with it. Now, I did mention earlier that the Carlton Marsh Nature Reserve has, um, a, has volunteers on site and some of these volunteers have been coming down on site a long time like I mentioned Keith and Cliff and here's another one called Ralph Hibbert now Ralph used to do lots of volunteer work on site and sadly he's passed away and this uh, seat has been erected in his memory and I will show you a close-up of that in a moment. <clears throat> and it's, you can see that it's in good condition, condition. And it's been up quite a while now. Uh, there is, on the right-hand side, uh, feathers in the seat. And I, I forgot to ask Keith why that is, Keith Bannister. And I'm sure he would have told me if I'd have asked him. I don't know the relevance of those feathers. But there's always three or four feathers there when I go past. And you can see on this occasion someone's left uh, a bunch of flowers in Ralph's memory. Uh, Ralph was a, when he retired, became a very, very keen outdoor person. And he and a friend of his used to do uh, butterfly surveys. And uh, what they did, they, they had um, permission at a certain time of the year to go uh, on this site and uh, wave their 
uh, butterfly nets about and that put the butterflies up in the air and then they recorded that they were on site counted how many there were and so on and so forth now, I should emphasize that they did this uh, by prior consent so you can't just do that yourself because on this particular site what you're looking at now is an embankment and the embankment is where the train line used to go and to the right of the embankment to the left of the embankment I should say uh, is a steep drop and that's where they were butterflying now here's um, a plaque with Ralph's uh, name on it I don't know what the other one said on the right where the flowers are but it does give Ralph Ralph's um, uh, age uh, and there is a, a memorial to him on there um, but I think you, you would have to go down and see that for yourself but you can see it's a very nice bench it's well thought out and uh, I'd, uh, I, I, you know, I'm a bit lost for words what to say because um, Ralph was very very keen and he, he, he were, was able to put some th uh, things uh, in the log that no one else ever saw down on that side he might have been down there on his own as I was when I was in Philly uh, but sadly um, I, I can't do that now because I have lots of other uh, uh, things that I must do but yes but Ralph what can I say other than uh, a genuine a very genuine man uh, a jovial man as well and uh, he loved to, to go down to the Camp Marsh hence the reason why this uh, bench is in his name um, because uh, some people uh, find this, uh, what can I say, to be um, a difficult thing to speak about, like I am struggling for words at the moment, because I am remembering Ralph as he was, and uh, I won't, you know, uh, to speak about it is still difficult. And relatives are obviously coming down. And, uh, and so there's lots of feeling going off down there. Oh, now, uh, so Ralph was, uh, looks like he was born in 1939 and died in 2020. And of course we're in 2021 now. Uh, and it's pretty, I didn't get a better shot of that. I thought I had actually. I must have moved. But it does say something like gazed upon the butterflies, listened to the birds, sitting on this bench of mine, think of me and smile. Uh, from f family and friends. And it's a very touching thing to, to read, isn't it? So, now, I mentioned earlier that the car park was full. And the reason for that is that this bench had just been erected in uh, only about 15 minutes before I took this shot and this bench was uh, is dedicated to a dear friend of mine and a person I work with uh, uh, on and off in the college and she on her quality time when she wasn't working she loved to come down to Carlton Marsh site and unwind and de-stress and speak to such people as me and uh, anyone else that was on site and speak about her passion which was nature and um, 
I'm not sure uh, if she took uh, any part in going to meetings about the site because I, as I said I finished on this site in 1981 so there's quite a long gap between that and now so she may have been involved in some way at committee levels and stuff like that and uh, a very interesting lady who taught a teacher, she was a teacher and she knew lots about different subjects and if she didn't know she asked and then she found out and she was um, interesting flowers as you can see on there butterflies uh, plants in general and uh, just a good all round nature lover really or to a naturalist I should say and um, she was a genuine sort of person uh, and passionate about uh, nature in general. So there's nothing on this bench yet, um, but you can see dragonflies on there as well. I've mentioned the other stuff. And there is a plaque on there, and I'm refraining from using a name at this moment until I've read the uh, plaque because I, I, I don't want to upset anybody if. I get a name wrong because at my age now I'm getting forgetful about names. In fact, Keith Bannister said exactly the same thing earlier on when I was speaking to him, that names are starting to elude him. And it's just one of the things about getting old. But what I would say is um, to Keith and myself is that we were privileged in a way to, although it was very hard work at the time, to have been able to get involved with a piece of land that uh, was turning into a rubbish dump really and turn it into the nature reserve it is today. And I wonder how many people would like to leave a legacy like that and uh, I'm certainly proud that I have been able to leave that sort of a legacy for uh, future generations and in particular this lady who has just had this um, bench erected and as I don't know how many people came down to look at the bench being erected or look at the bench after it had been uh, erected because there was no one around when I when I came but the car park was still full so they may have also thought, oh, well, we'll have a look on the reserve as well while, we, while we're on site, because they may not have been before. Now, to some people, the reserve is just a walk, because it's flat, uh, and an easy walk in some uh, cases. But you need boots on at this time of year, because it's sludgy, it's soft underfoot, and... Uh, it's well, it's well worth uh, getting uh, uh, proper clothing on as well because it gets cold. And uh, just another shot then to show you everything that's been put on this particular bench which covered uh, what the lady liked best in life. And uh, what, what, you know, um, it's difficult for me to speak about really uh, as you probably know but while I'm waiting for the name to come up I would say to you if you enjoy my uh, vlogs please give it the thumbs up and uh, also a nice comment would be nice now and again and um, if you need any more blogs of this type please let me know or if you have any comments you want to share and you, you would like to know things about uh, the areas that I go to 
one of the things I, I will be speaking about at some point is um, gates in leading into uh, woods because uh, that's a fascinating subject on its own um, but I have to go on a specific walk for that one and it means being out of the house at quite some time and I have to arrange it now but I have to carry a mobile with me and uh, uh, keep phoning my wife up so that she knows I'm alright uh, well we're coming to the end of the this particular video and it's gone on a lot longer than I thought it would go on uh, but uh, it's very difficult to keep talking, isn't it, about things like that. Much easier if I had, had a video, and I do apologise for it. I uh, will try and clean the sound up a bit, because it's a bit muted at the moment. But Elaine uh, will all be, always be in my thoughts, and I was pleased that I was able to take this uh, photograph of the bench in her memory from... Uh, our friends and loved ones so I, I, I'll leave you now uh, with that thought